Hi, this is Lauren from the Museum of Natural and Cultural History, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Archaeology for the People, the museum's 2020 virtual archaeology talks. I'd like to start this evening by recognizing that the museum and the University of Oregon are located on Kalapuya Elihi, their tra traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. We honor and recognize all indigenous people who continue to call the Willamette Valley home. During this evening's program, you can use the Q&A and chat features on Zoom and Facebook to uh, share your thoughts, engage with other viewers, and to ask questions of our speaker. I'll be collecting your questions from both platforms and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Also, we'll be providing a link to a brief survey in the chat box on both Zoom and Facebook. I'd appreciate it if you could take one to two minutes to fill it out as your feedback will help us improve future virtual museum programs. Before we get to this evening's talk, I have just a couple of upcoming programs that I'd like to share with you. Next week on October 29th, I'll be joined by Dr. Ayana Fluellen for the second of our annual archaeology talks. Dr. Fluellen will discuss the research at St. Croix's Estate Little Princess, a historic plantation site on the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the opportunities that that research project is providing to both local youths as well as students from historically Black colleges and universities in the United States. Then, on Wednesday, November 4th, I'll be joined by Christopher Hendon, UO Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry for the museum's monthly Ideas on Tap program. We'll hear about how to brew the perfect cup of coffee, which many of us may need if we've stayed up late the night before watching election results come in. So I hope that you can join us for both of those upcoming programs. Finally, if you are able, we're asking that you please consider making a secure tax deductible donation of five to $10 at the web address listed on the screen to help keep museum programs like this one accessible to all. That's giving.uoregon.edu slash MNCH gift. Your donation directly supports the museum's educational programming, bringing science and culture adventures to Oregonians of all ages and in every corner of the state. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Kimberly Fitzgerald. Kimberly is the City of Salem's City Archaeologist and Historic Preservation Program Manager. In 2020, she received third place in the Mark E. Mack Community Engagement Award from the Society of Historic Archaeology for the project Uncovering Salem's Chinese Shrine. She joins us this evening to share more about that project and how the practice of public archaeology can help amplify the stories of Oregon's historically marginalized communities. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm really excited to, to talk about our Chinese Shrine Project here at the Pioneer Cemetery in, in Salem. So most of you probably already know uh, where Salem is, but in case you are not from around here or haven't traveled, uh, Salem is Oregon State Capitol and is located in the Willamette Valley, about 50 miles south of Portland. Uh, before I get into talking about our project, I'm going to first give you a bit of background about how we started the project. The Salem Lands Landmarks Commission, which I staff, uh, was established back in 1985. And every year uh, they present their accomplishments and work plan for the upcoming year, which include goals related to historic preservation in our community. And one of the most important goals is to assist uh, with the public's understanding of Salem's local history. Our plan also has goals related to archaeology and education about our archaeological resources and cultural landscapes. So the National Historic Preservation Act, which is the basis of a lot of our local protections and national protections for historic resources, was originally adopted in 1966. And we celebrated 50 years in 2016. And as part of that, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation developed their priorities and recommendations for the future. And one of those priorities identified by the ACHP in 2016 
was to encourage especially local jurisdictions to identify and interpret historic places associated with the underrepresented communities uh, in, in our nation, such as the Chinese, the Japanese Americans, African Americans, uh, Latino and Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans. So our Landmarks Commission took that to heart and decided to prioritize finding out more about Salem's Chinese community. So I was directed along with my colleague Kirsten Strauss to uh, start researching what was happening in Salem. And so the first thing that we discovered was that Ben Maxwell, who had been one of our local newspaper reporters and a photographer, he had written one of the only histories that we could find about Salem's Chinese. And we were quite surprised to learn that Salem actually had a thriving Chinese community in the late um, 1800s with, when a number of uh, Chinese immigrants came to the Willamette Valley. So we, we began also exploring the writing uh, from a larger perspective of the Chinese American history just to get a better understanding of the historiography and also why Chinese American immigrants made the choices they did within the context of their political and economic situations. So what we found is that they left China primarily due to economic necessity. Years of famine and war forced many to leave in search of income for their families. They came and settled in Salem in the mid 1800s in what was known as the second wave after the gold rush and assisted with the construction of roads and railroads. And they established a community in downtown Salem. You've, you can see a Sanborn fire insurance map here on your screen from 1884. And so they essentially were located on the east side of Liberty between court and state streets, if you're familiar with Salem. And in 1884, they comprised about 12% of Salem's population, which was quite a lot for that time. And on the left side of your screen, you can see a map of Canton, China. That's the area uh, most of Salem's Chinese came from. So the 1880 federal census shows us that there were 89 people identified as Chinese living in Salem. The census reflected that a majority of the Chinese were men who worked as laborers, cooks, and laundry workers. However, some married and had families. As you can see here, a picture of Sung Lung. He had a laundry, and he also had a family. Um, that laundry was in Salem, located downtown along Court Street. You can see a picture here from 1888, and this this photo actually uh, was reprinted as part of a postcard series developed by the Barrack Funeral Home Salem in the past. And uh, Sun, Sun Lung operated this wash house until he returned to China in 1897. Uh, according to our local paper, he did intend to come back, but we couldn't find any evidence that he actually had. Um, looking further into additional census records, a Marion County census was taken in 1895 and they recorded 342 Chinese in Salem. Now that's a much higher number than the earlier number of 89 and we, we think it encompassed more than just Salem proper and a bit outside our boundary. So George Lai Sun, he came from China to Salem in 1868 when he was 16. Uh, during his life, uh, he raised a family and built successful businesses in Salem. In addition to his downtown store, he owned a ranch and a successful hop farm outside of Salem. Now I say owned, um, uh, Chinese um, were not allowed to own property, but his wife was born, um, he, he was able to own the property through his wife. That was a common practice. He was known as the mayor of Chinatown by the locals because he represented the interests of the Chinese in the community. Um, and on top of your screen, you can see a few pictures of him at the top left from 1875. Um, I mean, yeah, 1875 at the center. He's sitting with Dr. Bao Wo. Uh, and then on the upper right at his store in the 1920s. Dr. Lai Yik, his nephew, had a store and a medical practice also in Salem, and I have some pictures to show you here in a minute of him. 
But the cool thing I wanted to, to share with you that we discovered was uh, what we learned about the six companies. So those are the pictures of the gentleman on the bottom of your screen. So what we learned was that the six companies were established in the 19th century in San Francisco, beginning in 1849 with the gold rush that brought many Chinese to the western coast of the United States. By 1868, the Kong Chow Company had split into six, the Sam Yep Company, the Si Yep Company, the Ning Yuan Company, the, the Yung Wo Company, the Hop Wo Company, and the Hip Cat Company. I wanted to say them all. Uh, these companies recruited Chinese from China to come and work in the United States, and in exchange for a departure fee, uh, they ensured their care in, in America, as well as their return for China if they happened to die while over here for a burial. Uh, the six companies fought the United States government for legal rights on behalf of, of their members. They, they watched out for the poor and the indigent, and they appointed representatives within larger sized cities. So this is where um, the connection to George Sun comes in. So we found that uh, the six companies had appointed George Lai Sun to represent the Chinese in Salem. So he did many things for Salem's Chinese. Uh, and and his store was actually a hub of activity for the, for the Chinese in Salem. Uh, George Lai, um, his son, uh, Sui, he uh, described in an interview um, his, his father's store as, I'm gonna read a bit of a quote. So uh, his store was located where the Ben Franklin Bank is now at State and High and later moved to the corner of Ferry and High and he sold coffee, tea, candy, and tobacco. Behind the shop portion was a large room, which was used by Chinese who came from out of town as a card room and dormitory. A favorite game was dominoes, and George Sun also acted as a banker for the older Chinese in town who didn't trust banks. He had a reputation for astuteness and absolute honesty. So that was very interesting to find out. So Dr. Lai Yik, as I mentioned, um, a relative of George Lai Sun's, and he came from the same um, part of China, a close by village in the 1880s. And he served as a clerk for, for Sun initially, and then he established his own medical practice in uh, downtown Salem. He also owned the Shanghai Cafe, which was uh, also known as Nam King, which was on Commercial Street. It's, it was a noodle restaurant. In 1922, he hosted a dinner for 25 Salem residents, including Hal Patton, Governor Olcott, and Judge John McCourt. He chose to return to China with his family in 1923, and his village was known as Ha Pao Fao Village in, in Taishan. He, a letter to the Statesman Journal he wrote in 1928, he describes the new China under the new unified government, and this is what he says. China is now peaceful and we are thankful that war is over. It's now new China and the new unified national government is making great strides forward. The new government is very active and progressive and we look forward to a great future for China. My kindest greetings to those who remember me. I hope to return to Salem with my family in about one more year. So this was at, at Christmas time in 1928. So Salem also had a Chinese school we were quite surprised to discover. Uh, in 1889, Reverend Halt, a Chinese missionary from Portland, came to Salem to establish a mission school, which was actually part of Salem's Presbyterian Church. By 1896, even though the school was small, it was well established and well known in Salem. There were about 20 students, and by this time, they were giving an annual Christmas concert for the community. Uh, they also participated in uh, ch the city's Cherry Festival Parade. You can see there's a photo on the right side of your screen from 1908. And this float was actually organized uh, by Dr. Yip, who you had just heard about. Another uh, key figure in Salem was Hop Lee, and uh, he was born in China on December 12th in 1858. And his true name was actually Lo Sun Fook, but he adopted the name Hop Lee because he ran a hop farm. 
he he initially was a laundryman and merchant and hop grower and um he also he married uh, ah, ah Ki Hong, who was born in the United States. So they were able to own and operate a 612 acre hop farm, a laundry business, and a poultry shop in downtown Salem. He died in 1925. You can see his headstone here. And he was buried on his land, which was just outside of Salem. His remains were disinterred in 1948, and he was returned to China. So Dr. Kam Bao Wo, he, um, he was uh, also a doctor and he worked closely with, um, with Sun and he would represent the Chinese. He was also appointed by the six companies. So when um, George Sun couldn't act on behalf of the Chinese, um, Dr. Wo would do that as well. Uh, and I, I wanted to share this with you because it was one of the first references we were able to find about the extensive practices in the cemetery, which is going to be the core of our discussion later. But you see the, the article here, um, the community noted what the Chinese were doing um, in uh, honoring uh, Dr. Bo during his burial, uh, and I'll, I'm just going to read a little bit from this article, which I know is probably hard for you to see. Uh, Dr. Kumbo Wo was buried today, buried in a white man cemetery, but in accordance with the rites and ceremonies of the religion of his oriental forefathers. Scattered about his resting place in the morgue were dozens of little slips of paper with nine holes punctured in each and through which the devil would have to pass in making his way to the corpse. When the funeral procession marched to the cemetery this afternoon with the corpse in the hearse, there sat on the wagon carrying the dead box behind it and Oriental scattering the same, these same small slips of papers along the road. And there stood beside him the same tapers giving up their fumes to the air. Tonight, as he sleeps in his grave, the dreamless sleep of the dead, there will be scattered about his grave, the same papers with many holes in them. And besides the abundance of candles and nuts, there will be a feast of roast pork and duck and the many other good things pertaining to the faith of the Chinese religion. So that was interesting to find. So now I'm shifting gears again. We, we really wanted to get a better understanding of the, uh, the, the exclusion era. There's been a lot of really great work on the history of Chinese exclusion, and I'm not gonna go too deep into it here. That would take up too much time. But we were very interested specifically in how Salem's Chinese um, reacted to these anti-immigration policies. And in 1882, of course, the Chinese Exclusionary Act passed and was renewed um, with some additional uh, features by the Geary Act in 1892 by Congress, which allowed Chinese laborers to travel to China and re-enter the United States but Chinese were required to register and secure certificates as proof of their right to work in the United States. And in 1893, Salem's Chinese residents were supposed to report to register in order to comply with that recent, that Geary law, but um, were directed not to by the six companies through, um, through George Sun. So there's a quote there on your screen. I won't read that one. I th I'm hoping you can read it um, just fine, but um, it, it just articulates how they tried to uh, uh, register and, and they refuse to cooperate, so expressing their individual agency. So uh, another example, many, many Chinese chose to fight unfair immigration policies on their own. Uh, in the 1990s, the declassification of the Chinese immigration records provided us with a, a great and wonderful resource. The National Archives in Seattle have records of about 50 Chinese born in Salem residents who traveled, traveled to China or tried to come into the United States or both went back and forth. So one example here in 1897, Li Bing, he was a Salem born Chinese. He, tr he tried to leave and come back and was refused entry. His father filed suit and it took a while. It took until 1904, but he won and was able to come back into the country. So that was cool but some were not as successful. 
So this example, in 1913, Liang Tong-yuk, uh, he was determined to be what was called a paper son by immigration officials. He was actually George Sun's nephew, so his wife's brother, Liang Hun, was his father. And he was born in, in China, um, but um, Liang Hun came to Salem and was working with George managing that store together. But um, even after extensive interviews, uh, Liang tong Yuk was not allowed entry into the United States because they, they simply didn't believe that he was really Liang Hun's son. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my trip to China later on, but this is a picture. I was able to meet his grandson in China and I was able to see the village, which was described in amazing detail in the interview. You can just see the front page of that there on your screen. But uh, one of the things I think they tried to do to catch people up is they would interview multiple people uh, and ask for descriptions of physical locations to see if they matched. Well, it was surprising in this case, you know, they did match, but they still didn't believe he was really his son. So we were also interested in finding, about the, uh, finding out about local policies. In uh, 1903, uh, Salem City Council uh, passed an ordinance. It was actually their Committee of Health and Police. They determined that Chinatown was a menace to the health and safety of the community. And the um, Statesman Journal reported in a very flowery, dramatic article. I'm gonna read a bit of it for you here to get a sense. Uh, it said, farewell, old Chinatown, adieu ye public menace to health and morals and eyesore to the people of Salem and all who are guests within the gates of this otherwise beautiful city. The verdict has been sounded and your death knell has been sounded and before another summer sun shall have cast her warm beams broadcast over the city of Salem, your ashes will have been scattered to the four winds and the people of Salem will breathe a deep sigh of relief and cast you from their minds. But, but, but from your ashes, a more beautiful, modern, and sightly architecture will spring. So we wanted to verify whether this actually did occur. Um, so you, you can see several different Sanborn fire ins insurance maps. Actually, one's an overview. Uh, and uh, then this is an inset. So what we, we did discover, uh, interestingly enough, was that uh, they, the, they simply just moved a block south. Uh, so they moved from um, the north and south part of State, State Street over to uh, High End Ferry. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we figured that out. So we want to better understand why why they left. Um, so because they did they did leave. Uh, ben Maxwell's 1961 historical narrative, the very first one that we read, um, he writes about the Chinese in Salem and refers to a bell tower. Uh, you can see in the top picture, kind of in the background, uh, you can see a tower. It was actually a, a also used as a, f a fire tower to help put out fires, but um, Maxwell states he refers to the bell tower as a body house. Uh, the Var the Varani Corner at State and Liberty was also a Chinese den, and complaints about these rookeries and what went on with them was frequent and constant, is what Maxwell reported. But the council condemnation did not actually result in the destruction of Chinatown. We discovered um, in that night in that 1913 interview uh, about with the immigration officials. One of the immigration officials actually interviewed J.F. Hughes, and he owned the property that these buildings sat on. He also owned the property that they moved to. So um, it was wonderful to read. Uh, I'm going to read you a bit of this statement because he describes relocating the houses. He states, I moved those houses along down there in that part of town and have forgotten just how they were located, but they have been on that new lot for about 10 years. Um, Hughes decided, uh, so he, he was working with them and helping them at least initially but then he decided he wanted to redevelop. Uh, and so he, he began 
by raising the rents. He raised the rents $10 a month, which was quite a lot uh, back then for the Chinese that were renting from him on his property. And so by 1924, they had all moved out. They couldn't afford to stay. And he had redeveloped the blocks to the building that you see a picture on the bottom of your screen. He built what's now known as the Hughes Building. And the Capital Journal reported at the time, I'm just going to read you a quote from the newspaper. The Orientals feel that the rent they have paid in the past is as much as they can pay now. And as they view it, they must either secure other quarters or immigrate to Portland. The leaders have looked around the city for other quarters, but there seems to be none available. And the only alternative now seems Portland. Real estate dealers in that city, the Chinamen say, have made offers which are attractive, and while no definite decision has been reached, it looks very much now as though the Orientals will soon take a last lingering look at the capital city and bid it farewell. farewell. And they note that there are about 400 Chinese in, in Salem at the time. So that was when a, a majority of, of the people left, which was reflected in the census records. I'm going to just share a few more individual stories of people. Um, Jim Chung, he was in the paper a lot. He was a longtime resident of Salem. He had arrived in 1867 and spent 60 years of his life working primarily as a laborer. He cut wood. He worked on the local hop farms. He washed windows. And he left uh, to go back home uh, in 1927, and over 100 people came to say goodbye. He had been washing windows regularly at the Statesman Journal offices, so they reported about it. And even several years later, in that terrible comic at the middle of the screen, um, when the city of San was going to get their new, new stoplights, they, they referenced Jim Chung as he was going to miss um, seeing them set up. So we were also curious about those who came back to visit or came back to stay. Um, after World War II, we um, discovered the Sun family planted peaches and then the area where the Fred Meyer is now in South Salem, if you're familiar with Salem. They, they didn't um, stay, they sold the orchard in 1961. Uh, and uh, another family, so Kwong Hing, he, he um, ran a successful farm for many years. He was a hop farmer as well outside of Salem. He also had a slaughterhouse on Liberty where he, where he sold pork and chicken and duck. He had eight children he raised in Salem, including Rose, who's in the picture here. So Rose left Salem for Hollywood in the 1930s. She appeared in The Painted Veil, which was a Greta Garbo film, and came back to visit in October of 1934. She was actually part of a, a dance ensemble, The World of Girls, and she had just returned from playing seven weeks in Shanghai. And so her visit was reported in the Capital Journal. I'm going to read a bit for you. When Miss Wong was a youngster, she lived on High Street with her father, Kwong Hing, in what was then Salem's Chinatown. The new Salem Hotel was built in the old location, and little Miss Wong couldn't help but reminisce a bit about the good old days, grammar school days when she attended Garfield, all dressed up in a midi blouse and sailor tie, playing after school with Essie and Willie Hop Lee, well known to Salem folk. Another thing she remembered about Salem were the cherries. Never before or since have cherries compared to the ones we used to have in Salem, said the former local girl who's come home for a few days. Speaking of her mother and father, she said that both had died <clears throat> since 1919 and are buried in Salem City View Cemetery. I plan to go out this afternoon and take some flowers, but she says, the streetcars have all disappeared. How do you get out there now? <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway. Okay, so now um, shifting gears. Now that we have a good sense of the Chinese people in Salem, uh, why they came and what they did and when they left, our next question was, of, of course, do we really, do we have any remaining buildings? And we, we don't, uh, no extant buildings remain um, that we could find. So we then turned our attention to burials. So we began looking at the Salem Pioneer Cemetery. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about 
our, our Salem Pioneer Cemetery. So the, the first burial was in 1841. It, it's located far south of the original um, boundaries of Salem uh, at the time it was established. And the Chemeketa Lodge number one branch of the Independent Order of the Odd Fellows, IOF, organized the Odd Fellows Rural Cemetery in, in 1854. It began as a five acre plat, but was enlarged in 1861 and 1890 to an extent of 17.05 acres. In the 1950s, the IOF asked for help in maintaining the aging cemetery. Uh, for several decades, Marion County and the city of Salem shared joint maintenance responsibilities. In 1985, the city agreed to be the permanent steward, and in 1986, the IOF transferred the title of the cemetery to the city of Salem. Uh, Salem's Pioneer Cemetery was listed on the National Register in 2013 by Elizabeth Walton Potter, and it's now managed by the City of Salem Parks Department in collaboration with the Friends of the Pioneer Cemetery. So uh, the, the original portion of the cemetery was laid out in uh, 210 plots or blocks, each containing 16 grave lots. You can see a, a map there on the right side of your screen. Many of these plots were bordered with low stone or concrete curbs, and that'll, make, that'll matter here in a minute when I talk about what we did find initially. And as I mentioned, in 1861, an additional uh, 11 acres was added, increasing plots to 960, and then in 1890, an additional uh, 0.38 acre strip was added, and so that uh, brings us to the 64 additional half-size plots. So the cemetery is not actively used. Lots are no longer for sale, but you can petition to have a burial if your family owns a plot. So you can see a picture here of Peter Anderson on the left side of your screen. He completed an Eagle Scout project in 2011, and his interest was in trying to identify the Chinese burials in the cemetery. So he organized a field survey and reviewed the burials listed in the Friends of the Pioneer Cemetery database. It's a really cool database. Uh, they have a great website. Um, and created by Fern Helly, Addy Ricky, and Tracy Saucy. And along with 16 volunteers um, uh, from Troop 127, Peter, he, he was able to definitively locate 10 headstones of Chinese Americans in the cemetery. But our, um, if you look at the, the database now, you can do a search on the Chinese and it'll return about 80, 80 burial records. So we had some work to do to try and figure out what was um, happening there. So Elizabeth Potter had noted in the nomination that there was a Chinese section at the northern end of the cemetery. So we looked at local newspapers to, to try to find pictures uh, and any additional evidence. And on your screen there you can see um, the first evidence we found in the paper was in 1953. And it was an article in the Daily Capital Journal, again, by Ben, ben Maxwell, which describes a seven-man crew of city and county employees who discovered the shrine, or they called it a pagan altar, while they were in the process of installing fencing along the northern edge of the cemetery. And you can see the photos titled, Clearing IOF Cemetery Reveals Pagan Altar. And the article further describes the discovery of a number of funeral relics which were disposed of with finality, which as an archaeologist makes me sad. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. uh, About 10 years later, in 1963, the Statesman Journal published a second photo and an article with the, this caption had shrine uncovered in Pioneer Cemetery. And the article states that the shrine may have been associated with the 1916 flu epidemic in Salem, which we were never able, we didn't confirm that. But we were very excited. Uh, Kylie Pine of the Willamette Heritage Center found the original of this photo. And you can see here uh, City of Salem Parks Director Charles Gale kneeling in front of the shrine. And this was the one uncovered by parks crews during their cleanup work in the cemetery. And um, 
we'll, we'll, you'll see more later. I don't want to ruin it for you if you if you don't know. We we still have a lot of questions about what happened uh, to the shrine after this picture was taken because its condition um, deteriorated significantly. But. Um, back to the story. So we still didn't know exactly where it was. Uh, the picture didn't really give us clues, even though it was wonderful to find. The northern edge of the cemetery uh, was the field owned by Marion County, which held plots for burials of indigents and those with no families or those too poor to pay for their own burial. And, and it's within this area of the cemetery that, uh, that Elizabeth Potter notes in the National Register nomination that there was a little square or a little plot reserved for the Chinese of Salem for temporary burials. And again, temporary, the, uh, the Chinese tradition would be to temporarily bury and then disinter and return them to their home villages. So our first challenge, of course, was to try to, try to figure out where it would be along that very long northern boundary. So at this point we realized, Kirsten and I realized we needed a bit more help from the community. So we established, uh, the Landmarks Commission established the Chinese Shrine Advisory Committee in September of 2017. And this was a subcommittee of our Landmarks Commission and members included representatives from Salem's Chinese American community as well as representatives from the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. Additional members included uh, Landmarks Commission, representatives from the Oregon State Historic Preservation Office, the Friends of the Pioneer Cemetery, Salem Parks Department, Willamette University, both students and professors, and the Willamette Heritage Center. We also had representatives from the Hoi Yin Association. This was an association established in 1890 for the overseas Chinese, specifically from the Taishan area. And we found there's over 10,000 members in the Willamette Valley. So it was exciting to discover. So the committee set goals for the project. You can see on your screen, of course, our first was research, 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 and um, then doing survey and mapping to help us locate the shrine. Uh, the first type of survey is non-invasive non survey. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, we would limit any sort of adverse effect to the cemetery itself, as well as inadvertently uncovering any burials, which is why it was important to do that non-invasive survey. And then we hoped to narrow down the potential location and excavate and locate the remainder of the shrine and uncover any associated artifacts. And then of course, develop interpretation both on site and exhibits. So those were our goals. And so uh, luckily, very excitingly, through our uh, connections on the advisory committee, we met Rick Hiltz. He's the manager of the City View Cemetery, which is just adjacent to the Pioneer Cemetery. And he grew up across the street from the cemetery and recalled playing as a child and remembered the general location of the shrine, which really, really helped us significant, significantly help uh, narrow down where to look. So he brought us to the picture you can see there on the, the left side of your screen. That's what it looked like. Uh, it looked like a, a small fragment of concrete showing very similar to the, um, there was concrete like this all around the cemetery. So we weren't sure if this was actually what remained of the Chinese shrine or just a portion of concrete curbing typical to the curbing found throughout the cemetery around many of the graves but we went ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, in collaboration with Willamette University, uh, we did ground penetrating radar survey in September and did a magnetometer survey uh, that uh, Kendall McDonald came down to do that on Oct in October of 2017 with Professor Pike from Lama and several student volunteers. And you can see some of the results on, on your screen there. They're a little bit difficult to read if you're not used to reading them. But I will tell you that the survey noted a number of different anomalies, which were consistent, of course, with burials, which made us, it was not surprising to find that. Um, but there was also uh, anomalies that the magnetometer picked up associated with um, 
things that were metallic. So we did have a wonder and still have a curiosity about whether or not there are remnants um, buried from fencing or, or other types of, of artifacts associated with uh, burials and then disinterments. So, uh, but overall, uh, we were able to locate um, where, the, where the anomalies were and we're pretty confident that doing excavation, we wouldn't uh, inadvertently uncover any burials. So we decided to move ahead. Oh, so now I'm going to share with you a short little video. This was put together by the local paper um, and shows what we were doing before the excavation. Great, so we had a great team of, of volunteer archeologists, uh, Jamie French, Eric Gleason, and Jackie Chung, and we also had Paul Hampson, as well as uh, Professor Pike's team from Willamette University. We laid out six uh, one meter by one meter units, and almost right away, we successfully uncovered the shrine just, before, just below the surface. It was very exciting. It was just about 23 centimeters below the surface, you can see here, but uh, contrary to the pictures that you'd seen earlier of the, the whole shrine, you can see it was quite damaged. And again, we, we're still doing research to try and figure out what exactly happened. The marble tablet at the center was sadly broken and it looked as though it was it, they tried to remove it. So not sure why. Um, and you can see here a lot of our team. Uh, we've got um, the Willamette students and our archaeologists working hard cleaning it up and doing a little bit of excavation on the units just adjacent to the shrine itself. And then uh, someone from our city surveyor's office who was shooting in the points for the shrine so we don't ever lose it again in case something happens. Um, we held an open house that week to share our findings uh, with the public and also gave children and grown-ups an opportunity to, to try screening. Uh, we had about 30 different folks from the area come and, and look and see what we found. Um, but one of the most exciting outcomes of this open house was that a neighbor uh, who lived nearby the cemetery, he brought us two Chinese um, headstones that he had found in his, his backyard. These headstones were most likely discarded at the time the remains were disinterred and returned to China. The stones were translated by a, um, a Friends of the Pioneer Cemetery member who's actually from China. You can see her pictured here at the bottom middle of your screen, Jinglin Guo. And she was able to translate the names and um, the names of the home villages, which were actually inscribed on the stones, which is really exciting. And this information proved to be helpful in guiding both our research about the disinterments as well as helping to determine precisely where Salem's Chinese were from within the Taishan province in, Guang, in Guangdong, China. So as I've talked about off and on, it was Chinese custom to disinter remains of the deceased Chinese after a temporary burial to return to China. Uh, in Salem Cemetery, uh, these graves were most likely marked with wooden headboards that were removed after disinterment, but not always, as you can see by the example of the ones that were ca carved. And so part of our project was trying to pick up on the work that um, Peter had started for his Eagle Scout project to try and determine how many of Salem's Chinese residents were disinterred and returned to China and, and how many still remained buried but un, unmarked. And so um, OSU has a great um, collection of disinterment documents. You can see on their screen some of the images. So 
Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, George Sun was responsible for uh, returning those uh, Salem's Chinese who were part of the six companies. And that was most commonly before uh, the 1928 disinterment. And then it was the, um, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent uh, Association who took responsibility. So they had a, a Here's a roster you can see from 1928, and we were able to find Salem's Chinese um, listed on this list, so that was really exciting. There was another disinterment that happened in 1948, but that was the last one um, before the change in politics and the, the communist government in China shut that down, so they didn't allow anybody um, to be returned to their villages after that time, which is unfortunate. So uh, one of the things uh, that I did as part of this research was I reached out to uh, Wu Yi University in China. So, um, and, and I'll talk about my trip in just a second, but they were helping us try and figure out on the Chinese side of things in China, the kind of records that they had. So we looked through a number of sources that we had locally, uh, including the index of burials found at the city of Salem and this register, um, the city of Salem city recorder has uh, for the Oddfellow Cemetery. And then we cross, cross reference this with the database I uh, created by the Friends of the uh, Pioneer Cemetery. And what we found, um, there, there were approximately 111 total Chinese buried in, in the cemetery. Our best guess is that 71% appeared to have been disinterred and the remains shipped um, back to China. A majority of these were men. Um, 34 were unnamed. They just appear in uh, the register as Chinamen or Chinese. And uh, 32, we think, are buried in the Pioneer Cemetery, and as Peter discovered, we have the 10 um, headstones. So uh, the remaining 22 um, have locations that are, that are unknown. So I made a decision to go to China to continue to work with Wu Yu University. It was very exciting. Um, uh, I worked with Dina Chen. She was my translator and tour guide. And I wanted to um, visit f a minimum of four different villages in China uh, to, uh, to find out if the remains actually made it back to the, their villages, but also to try to connect with descendants uh, who lived there. So this map kind of generally shows the area. Uh, you can see China is very big. <laughs> Uh, and I was down there in, in Guangzhou in the Guangdong province. Uh, and I, I just went to four villages, which were very close to the, to the coast. And here's a, another uh, map. Um, I went to the Taishan province in, and went to four different ancestral villages. Two of the villages uh, were those names on the headstones that we um, got back in during the open house. And the other two, uh, I went to George Sun Lai's village and Liang Tong Yuk's. Um, so I got to meet the descendants there. That was the picture I had shared with you earlier. So this is a picture of Su Lao Xing's descendant. He's looking at a picture of the headstone. He had, had just come in from working in the uh, rice fields. And he had never known what had become of his relative, and he actually asked if I had brought the headstone <laughs> with me. He had hoped to, to have that. You can see um, Jinglin's translation there at the top of your screen as well. Uh, this was the marketplace near George Sun's village. He sent quite a lot of money back home to his village, and as I, I was told, they used it to build um, this marketplace, among other things. Uh, and you can see the in the center of the bottom there picture that's um, Liang Tang Yuk's uh, family grandson, and we got to eat a meal together. It was really lovely, uh, and. They, they talked about, of course, he never, he never came to America. He just stayed in China and married. And it was remarkable that, I, you know, I had brought the, 
immigration interviews and I was able to compare what he had dis his grandfather had described and it looked exactly as he described in the interview records. So that was pretty cool. Uh, this, uh, the, the picture on the left side of your screen, Dina is pointing to a, a poll that the Chinese government had started doing some on-site interpretation, just like we're doing here, about the what they call the overseas Chinese. So that was really kind of exciting to see that over there as well. This is actually the, the burial of Liang Tong Yuk, and it's notable. Um, it was located far outside his village. They didn't have an equi equivalent of a cemetery like uh, we had in Salem. Uh, he was buried al al alone, but on a mountainside. And to get there, I had to cross a rice paddy, and I fell in and got all wet, and they thought that was pretty funny. Uh, but they had uh, freshly swept the grave in preparation for um, Qingming. So that's a picture of it there. That's pretty cool. I've got a few pictures in here. I'm also a city planner, so I just want to point out that um, the layout of the villages that I visited in this particular region of Taishan are all quite similar. The houses are all laid out across from small bodies of water, often in rectilinear rows, and the blueprint um, on the left side of your screen was on display at a local museum produced by the government showing an ideal layout of a Chinese village. Uh, the lower right, you can see banyan trees. Um, and at the center, the center photo was in Jiangmen, and it was just in a mall. That's a, the larger city where Wu Yi University is, and it's a model of a newer modern apartment complex. It's hard to see the body of water, but the general layout is exactly the same, even though these aren't small village houses, these are tall high rises. I thought that was pretty cool. So I also went to uh, uh, the Wu Yi Overseas Chinese Museum in Jiangmen, and I thought, again, their attention to also interpreting and trying to also understand the experience that um, the Chinese had in when they emigrated to other countries. They didn't just go to uh, America. They went to a lot of different uh, countries around the world uh, to try and make things better for their families at home. So I'm just gonna read to you the um, what's on the panel there, that's the, on the left side of your screen. And after difficult years of the exclusion of Chinese, the overseas Chinese gradually became citizens of their adopted countries. In the post-war period and the, in, and their mentality changed from that of so, sojourning into taking roots. They strove in their adopted countries to build Chinatowns with traditional Chinese culture and developed a Chinatown economic model. They formed community organizations, fought for their rights, founded newspapers and schools. They carried on traditional Chinese cultures. They made unique contributions to their adopted countries and won their legitimate rights in their adopted countries. So I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, it was clear that the Chinese were coming back to China and bringing new ideas with them from the places they were visiting. Uh, the Dialu, I don't know if I pronounced that right, are these multi-story watchtowers in rural villages made of reinforced concrete. They're mostly in uh, Kaiping County of um, Jiangmen, which is not where I visited. Um, they were constructed through the 1920s and 30s, um, mostly with the economic and financial help of the overseas Chinese sending money back. And they were to help uh, security uh, the villages to protect against bandits. Uh, there are about 1,800 left in this region. And again, while it wasn't common in the area I visited, uh, Chelsea Rose, who some of you probably heard speak, she worked in an area where these were quite common. So that was pretty cool to see. So I'm saving the best for last. So the biggest surprise of my journey, which I honestly didn't go with the intention of finding or researching, was the discovery of these community shrines or tables in these in the every single in each of the four villages that I visited, which looked very similar to the one that we have here in Salem. So that was a, a huge surprise and they were actively being used. You can see that the top two pictures, they're two different types and they were decorated for Chinese New Year 
and had food on them, <laughs> I think, um, and flowers as well. Uh, it, it was so intriguing. We, we did a bit of research and I think we need to do a little bit more on this, but um, we were able to do a little bit of research also and to see if anyone else has looked into this. Salem Shrine may also be similar to one in Marysville, California. Uh, so Paul Chase in his book on Dying American, um, he describes the, the shrine in uh, Marysville um, as follows. I'm just going to read a little bit. At some point between the 1850s and 1889, a still surviving shrine was constructed in this cemetery and dedicated to the good Chinese friends, brothers without recorded names, with a platform for making presentations. A simple brick oven was added for burning offerings, and in 1889, a handsome new brick oven was constructed. So that was pretty neat to read. Uh, Terry Abram and Priscilla Weggers have also done quite a bit of research on this and um, we need to spend more time looking at what they've done, but they've looked at um, many uh, shrines and altars in their study of Chinese cemeteries. And um, I, I think, you know, it would be important to really research and look in more into more where these could be found in other parts of, of the world, actually. So we did a second excavation in 2018 and we uncovered the grate. You can see there a picture on the left side of the screen. It was very exciting as it, it confirmed with physical evidence that there was a burner associated with the shrine. We excavated deeper, also trying to find the base because we had a theory that it wasn't constructed flat, but was more of a table, uh, like the lower picture of the one I saw in China there on the bottom left of the screen. But we didn't find the bottom, so we get to do more. <laughs> uh, we were thrilled when Kylie Pine, again, she discovers all the cool stuff. Uh, she found this article by Ann Lossner, published in 1980, featuring an interview with Sui Sun, George Sun's, George Lai Sun's son, <laughs> where he discussed uh, the Qingming Festival, or Chinese Memorial Day specifically. I'm certainly not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to read a small part. In the Chinese section, there was a large slab raised to make a table. At the back was a raised portion filled with dirt. Next to it was an open oven. The Chinese candles, which were short and slim, about the size of a man's finger, were lighted together with the sticks of punk and set into the dirt. Then the men knelt and recited prayers for the dead. Rising, they folded each specially shaped paper around a narrow strip of paper in an intricate manner bowed three times, lighted the paper from the candles, bowed again, and tossed the burning paper into the oven. This was repeated until there was a blazing fire. And so that was wonderful to read, and it confirmed a lot of our um, theories. Uh, the, the advisory committee um, uh, then had some decisions to make. So um, uh, at the end of Ann Lossner's 1980 article, she, she ends with the following. It was sort of sad. The, she says, the ceremony table is no longer at the Pioneer Cemetery, although there are a few Chinese graves there. And uh, she says that there will be no ceremony April 5th in Salem this year. The colorful tradition has faded uh, into Salem's history. So our committee actually said, well, no, we want to reinstate this festival in Salem again. And we want um, Salem's Chinese community to use the shrine as it has been used historically. So uh, our committee, and I, I think it was Marcus Lee, one of the committee members um, from the Chinese Beloved Association, he recalled a meaningful blessing at the site of the uh, Lone Fir Cemetery, but also at the site of the Chinese massacre at Hell's Canyon, which helped to heal the great trauma that had occurred there. And again, we don't really know why the shrine was broken and covered up in Salem Cemetery, but we do know that Salem's Chinese weren't treated uh, well, and they, they were essentially pushed out. So the group determined a blessing uh, would be really helpful from the local, uh, we had a Salem Chinese Buddhist temple in Salem, and we also, um, our mayor, the Salem's mayor, um, read an apology and a proclamation. So I'm going to play you another video here of the 
first Qingming Festival celebration in So it was a wonderful experience and the celebration of Qingming was held again in April 2019 and will hopefully continue to be an, an annual tradition moving forward. You can see in the picture on the right, we've added a burner as part of the tradition, the traditional uh, celebration. Um, turning our discussion to exhibits and on-site interpretation, in, in addition to the shrine, a total of 291 artifacts were recovered from the two excavations. And you can just see a bit of a sampling here. Uh, the most significant diagnostic artifacts were ceramic shards with the clear Chinese markings and fragments of glass, which were likely remains from the dishes placed at the ceremonial table. So some of these artifacts were shared at an exhibit at the Willamette Heritage Center, as well as an exhibit in Portland in the BPA lobby during Asian American Heritage Month. Um, we installed a wrap around an existing utility box in the cemetery close to the Chinese shrine in the cemetery. We, and we've also installed a panel downtown with the history of Salem's Chinatown. You can see pictured here, it was a joint meeting in 2019 of the SACHP, the Heritage Commission and the Cemetery Commission. So we were able to share the work that we had done in our, our cemetery and that was cool. You can see Kirsten, she's talking about it there at the center the picture. Uh, so I, I would like to close by saying that for this project we use a model that's been used for many years by city planners uh, coordinating public participation through engagement of the local uh, jurisdiction empowers archaeologists to successfully engage the public by working within an existing local framework and through this Historians, archaeologists alike can coordinate public participation through engagement through an existing landmarks commission or by creating uh, an advisory committee like we did. And this method, I think, uh, is really effective to empower marginalized populations and create a, a deliberative public value within um, this existing framework. And it can be really effective and meaningful and it, I think can be easily adapted for different kinds of projects, uh, public projects and even academically driven projects. Uh, uh, through the outreach associated with this project and the Qingming Festival, many of Salem's Chinese Americans have found a way to meaningfully, meaningfully connect to the history of Salem's um, Chinese history and the Chinese people. Salem was home to hundreds of Chinese Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century. And unfortunately, while their Chinatown has been lost, uh, this funerary table and shrine, which is now currently actively being used again, remains uh, a testament to the connection they retain to their home villages in China and evidence of the Chinese traditions they continue to practice here in the Willamette Valley. So that's all I have. We have more information on our website if you want to learn more. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I really appreciate you taking time to share that story with us tonight, or many interwoven stories there with us tonight. Um, so we have time just for a couple of questions. So starting back um, towards the beginning of the presentation, someone is hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about the six companies um, and their role in the community and 
whether they were operating statewide um, in some of the big cities or if it was restricted to Salem. Uh, yeah, based on what I read, they were based out of San Francisco and they were actually operating, uh, as I understand it, on the West Coast, definitely in the major cities, uh, Salem, uh, Portland and Seattle, definitely San Francisco. I'm not certain I didn't d dive deep enough to know whether they were operating nationally, but they did, uh, like you saw with uh, what happened with the registration, they helped uh, everyone organize and react collectively as a unit in, in, a, in a way um, to help, uh, I hope, I think change uh, the tide of things and eventually I think uh, helped work towards legislation that ended the exclusion era practices. Yeah. Great, thank you. We have one that's probably a little bit outside your wheelhouse, but I'll go ahead and ask it. And yeah. as we always tell all of our interpreters at the museum, it's, it's good to say, I don't know. <laughs> um, so someone is asking um, whether you have found any photographs or references to kite flying by Chinese immigrants in Salem or Oregon um, during that time period in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Interesting. Kite, fly, kite flying? Kite flying. Um, I, well, when I was in China at the overseas um, Chinese museum there in Jiangmen, they actually had a whole room devoted to really cool, creative. Um, so they had kites, but they also had different types of uh, early airplanes. Uh, so, so um, yes, I did see it there, but I, I haven't found any evidence in Salem of that kind of activity, although that would be cool. <laughs> All right. And we have just one more question. So we'll just go ahead and end on this one and wrap it. Oh, one just came in. We'll sneak in two more. Um, <laughs> someone is wondering whether there is a, was rather, a Chinese community in Eugene, um, similar to the one in Salem. and. Um, if there, if you know of any burial locations in any of the um, cemeteries yeah, here, that's a that's a really good question. I do not know the answer to that question, um, and I would refer uh, you to the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association or Chelsea Rose, who's who's looking at the whole uh, Chinese question from a statewide perspective. So if um, I, of course, my contact information is not on the screen anymore, but you, you can also email me and I can get you in touch with Chelsea. So. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and Chelsea is out of Southern Oregon University. Yes. So um, you might just be able, for the person who has that We'll find her, yeah. yeah find her um, with a quick Google search. Yeah, she's a rock star. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So we'll end with uh, one final question, and it is from someone asking whether there are any plans to do anything about the unmarked burials in the Pioneer Cemetery. That's a most excellent question, and it's certainly one that our committee has um, thought about quite a lot. It's really uh, a challenging one, though, because we don't want to disturb um, uh, the area, you know, you could look at this as an archaeologist and do excavation, but that's really disruptive and I don't think appropriate uh, and appropriate treatment. And I think that, uh, so for example, one of the things that we did um, during the, that first Qingming festival is, is read all the names of the people um, that we believe are still buried there. Well, I, I didn't read them. It was um, the... Um, Chinese community, the elders of the community read them. And so the purpose of the Qingming Festival is to honor your ancestors. And it, it's also known as the, it's like our Memorial Day. And so I think that that's a way to honor those that are buried there in unmarked um, graves is to just remember them and celebrate the Qingming Festival. Well, hopefully we'll be able to celebrate that festival this coming year. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Everything will be normal again. <laughs> well, I want to thank you again for um, sharing this with us tonight. I want to thank everyone out there who tuned in to watch. Um, and if you um, 
know anyone who you missed it, who you think would like to catch tonight's talk, we will be posting it tomorrow to the museum's YouTube page. If you just Google YouTube MNCH, it should be the first thing that comes up in your browser. Um, so thank you again. And for those of you watching on either Zoom or Facebook, there is a link to the brief survey. Um, it should only take you about one minute to fill out. So please um, do take the time to do so if you can. So thanks again. Have a Great. good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.